This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This lecture is on Chapter 28 of the um, Paper F2 Free Lecture Notes and is on Divisional Performance Measurement. Uh, because many companies are what we call divisionalised in that you have separate parts of the company uh, where the managers are responsible for their part, their division of the company. And we need to measure how well that division is doing and how well the manager is doing. Um, obviously, we'll have non-financial performance measures, and we've been through that um, in the previous chapter. Uh, but it's when we come to financial performance measures um, that we need to consider how we're going to measure how well the division is doing. Obviously, we want more profits, uh, but just to a measure purely on the profit would be misleading because some divisions might be a lot bigger than other divisions. You know, and if it's a much bigger division and if we've invested much more in it, uh, then we'll expect a bigger profit. Uh, and so we need to relate the profitability to the size of the division. And we can be division in several ways. Uh, they could be in different locations. You know, I may have a company uh, where one division is in one city, and perhaps it's a teaching company, uh, and there's uh, a, 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 an office in one city teaching students, and there's another office in another city teaching students. Uh, they're all part of the same company, but again, I want to measure how well the individual divisions are doing. And again, one may be a lot bigger than another, the therefore we expect more profit. Or they can be divisions within the same building. Um, an accounting firm is like to have a tax division, an audit division, with managers responsible for each of them. Again, we want to measure how well the division, how well the managers are actually performing. Uh, and as I say, to, to measure purely on absolute profit would be silly. Bigger divisions, you expect more profit. And there are two standard measures you need to be aware of. And the first one is something called the return on investment, or ROI, for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, and this, actually, I think is the more obvious of the two measures we're going to look at. Um, what we do is, when we come to measure performance, we get them to produce a set of financial statements. And as you can see under paragraph two, the return on investment is defined as being the profit from the division as a percentage of the net assets, the amount invested in the division. And so a very easy one. Look at example one. Uh, a division reports a profit of 50,000. That's their accounting profit on net assets in their statement of financial position of 400,000. And it says calculate the return on investment. And so what's it going to be? The return on investment, the profit is 50,000. Uh, the net assets, 400,000. And so 50 on 400, it's 12.5%. So that's the measure of performance. And standardly, year by year, when you're measuring how well the division's doing, you'd say, um, has the return on investment gone up? Good. Has it gone down? Bad. Uh, a fairly, again, I think a fairly obvious measure, because it's uh, identical, if you think back to an earlier chapter, to the return on capital employed. Uh, we don't talk here about capital employed because the division isn't a separate company. It doesn't have capital as such. Um, it's the net assets the amount the company is invested in that division. Well, that's fine. Uh, but there is another, I'm oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It does obviously relate the profit to the size of the division. I said before, the more the net assets are, the bigger the division, the more profit you'd want. So instead of just looking at the 50,000 on its own, we're relating the two, we're doing it as a percentage. However, uh, the other measure we might use 
is a little bit less obvious. It's not harder arithmetically, but a bit less obvious, and it's called residual income, or RI. And to explain what it is, look at example two. A division reports a profit, it's the same question effectively, but um, a division reports a profit of 50,000 on net assets um, in their statement of financial position of 400,000. Uh, the company as a whole has a target rate of return of 10%. So the company is after a 10% return uh, on its capital. And it says calculate the residual income of the division. Well, obviously we're interested in profits, and the profit is 50,000. Okay, I've got the division to produce a profit statement, and the profit's 50. Uh, however, again, although we want obviously more profit, we need to relate it to the size of the division. And the way we relate it on this approach is we subtract what we call notional interest. I'll come back and explain the word in a minute. Uh, notional interest at the target rate of return, which here is 10%, on the net assets in the effectively statement of financial position. So they've got net assets of 400,000. And so when we come to measure performance, Again, we take the profit for the year 50,000. We subtract interest at the target return on the net assets, so 40,000. And what's left here, 10,000, is the residual income. And so it is relating um, the profit to the size of the business because. Um, Again, we want more profit, uh, but this notional interest is calculated on the size of the um, net assets, the size of the division. And so um, I think fairly obviously uh, here, in order to get a positive residual income, we need the profits from the business to be at least 40,000 for it to be, if you like, worthwhile. And what we measure them on is the residual income. If that goes up, they're doing well. If that goes down, they're doing badly. And so get more profit, great, residual income goes up. But if we needed more investment to get more profit, this interest goes up. And so it's making sure that, again, we are relating the two together. Uh, notional interest, the word notional means pretend. I don't know if you can read that, but it means pretend interest. What I'm getting at is we don't actually sort of invoice the division uh, with this interest amount. Uh, it doesn't appear in the um, books of account at all. It's simply when we come to measure the performance at the end of the year, if you like, on a piece of paper, we do this arithmetic uh, and calculate this residual income. So it's pretend interest. Um, so there are the two approaches, return on investment, just like return on capital employed, and the higher it is the better, residual income, uh, they're measured on the profits less, this notional interest. Uh, now paragraph four, sorry, that's just the workings, so obviously make sure you can do the workings. Um, but paragraph four says advantages and limitations of the two, you know, why prefer one, why prefer the other. Uh, return on investment is a much more common approach, uh, partly because its um, managers are more familiar with it. You know, I think most managers, even if they're non-accountants, will have heard of the return on capital employed, and even if they haven't, it seems fairly obvious, I think, what we're doing. Whereas although residual income isn't um, difficult arithmetically, 
it does look a bit unusual. It's not as easy, perhaps, to understand. Uh, so that's good. Uh, another reason for choosing return on investment is it's, it's better when comparing divisions of different sizes. So, you know, I said earlier, uh, the reason we need to relate the profit to the size of the division is because you'd expect a bigger division to have a bigger profit if they're doing as well. Uh, well, with return on investment, fine. You know, suppose I had another division. So let me quickly make up some figures. Another division that had, um, oh, net assets of a million. And they had a profit of, let's say, 150,000. Then, of course, in percentage terms, the return on investment is 15%. Um, we can compare the two. It's no, it would be no good just saying that other division, the red one, has bigger profit, it's better. That would be stupid. But in percentage terms, fine, they are, they are doing better. But you see, when it comes to residual income, all right, the profit may be, what was it, 150,000. Okay, they'll be charging our, no, this notional interest, 10% of, was it a million? A million? 100,000. A profit of 50,000, sorry, a residual income of 50,000, hugely bigger. But that on its own doesn't mean they're doing better. You'd expect it to be hugely bigger anyway, because it's a bigger division. So return investment is better from that respect. As far as residual income is concerned, though, uh, the one beauty of this is it does enable the company to give a precise target. You know, uh, we said the target return is 10%. That's the return the company wants. Whereas return on investment, uh, we don't set a target in the same way. Uh, we say the, the job of the division, the job of the manager, is to improve the return on investment each year. Maybe some divisions are already doing terribly well. Maybe some divisions are doing very badly. Their job is to improve it. Uh, but there's no direct target otherwise. But the residual income, if the company wants 10%, well, it does rather force the division to make sure that they are getting at least 10%, because they're going to be charged 10%. Uh, finally, just one extra thing, which isn't actually in the notes, but just to be safe, although it's something that's much more relevant when you come to F5. If you're man measuring the manager, You see, we, there's two things here. You want to measure that the division's doing well, uh, but maybe you, you want to measure that the manager is doing a good job. There's one thing we need to be careful of if we're measuring the manager, that whichever method we're using, return on investment or residual income, we only consider what we call controllable profits. And by controllable, I mean controlled by the manager. And what I mean by that, you see, ideally in a division, the manager is responsible for all the costs and all the revenues. <clears throat> you know, it's their job to run it as though it's their own little company. However, there might be cases when I can't let them have control over everything. For instance, it's come time to um, review wages. And I've decided 
that we can't have one division giving pay rises of 10% and another division only giving pay rises of 2%. I might say it's vital, you know, that we treat all our staff similarly. <clears throat> and so maybe I, as managing director, and maybe I say, right, everybody will get a wage rise of 5%. I'll effectively fix the wages. And if I'm fixing the wages, it's not fair that the manager should suffer if I say that oh, there'd be a big pay rise and it means less profit. It's not the manager's fault. And so if it's the manager we're measuring, we'll take the profit, but we'll take out of it anything that the manager doesn't control. For that purpose, we'd work out what the profit would be, excluding wages. Because again, wages wasn't the fault of the manager. So that's what I mean, and it's it's less relevant for F2, it's much more of a paper F5 thing. But just in case, if the division we're measuring, it's just the final profits. If it's the manager we're measuring, then it's the profit that they control, sales less the expenses that they control. Okay, so there we are. Not a lot there, but do learn, obviously. Uh, what we mean by return on investment and residual income.